All right, up next, Dr. Binkley, professor in the Division of Geriatrics at UW-Madison, director of the UW Osteoporosis Research Program, and associate director of the UW Institute on Aging with some guideline review for us. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Great. Uh, so I was asked to talk about the Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation guideline update. And because people were unwise enough to give me the, the podium, I uh, have to talk about other guideline related stuff. And as always, the orange font is my opinion and you'll, you'll see um, a fair amount uh, of that. Uh, one of the authors of the uh, Bone Health and Osteoporosis Foundation guideline update is Mike Mawicki. And I actually should mention that in addition to being World Osteoporosis Day, this is also the first birthday of the BHOF. So it was October 20th of last year that NOF became BHOF. Uh, and Mike, uh, I like this quote, all guidelines are wrong, but some are useful. Um, well, that, that made me ask, what are guidelines supposed to do? What are they supposed to be? And uh, basically it's, uh, as you see here, that uh, guidelines are meant to help ensure that patients receive appropriate treatment and care. That's why we have this plethora of guidelines on everything. Are osteoporosis guidelines ensuring appropriate treatment of osteoporosis in Wisconsin? The short answer is no. Uh, that's not anything unique to Wisconsin or to the United States for that matter. If you're not familiar with the Milliman Report, I would encourage you to look it up. It was just published a year or so ago and it's uh, all Medicare claims data. And what uh, they showed for Wisconsin is that if you're a Medicare woman, uh, Medicare beneficiary and female in Wisconsin, you have about a one in 20 chance of having a fracture in the next year. And like all the data that we're all familiar with, if you break your hip in Wisconsin, you've got a 30% mortality at one year and a 20% mortality at, uh, after any fracture. They did look at bone density testing after fracture, and it was 8% within six months. Worse if you're Black, worser if you're Native American. Uh, but of course, uh, we're here at, at UW Health and we must be doing better than that. And while we are doing a little better, 15% had a DEXA and only 22% uh, had a 25 hydroxy D level. That's unpublished data. So clearly guidelines are not ensuring appropriate care. <clears throat> so another good quote, failure is success and progress. Why are we not succeeding? And it's my bias that one of the reasons is we have too many guidelines. I went to guidelines.gov recently, entered osteoporosis treatment, got 531 hits. We have 531 guidelines for osteoporosis treatment. How can clinicians not be confused? We need to harmonize guidelines. And there was a small step toward that, that a, a group uh, led by Mike Mawicki uh, looked uh, and tried to harmonize Canada, the United States, and Mexico. And uh, this is sort of a mother god and apple pie sort of thing. Uh, but I did highlight a couple of things uh, from that, that uh, they recommended using uh, fracture risk algorithms to guide drug treatment, uh, that anti-resorptives are first line, except for very high fracture risk, go with anabolics. Now, this is what the BHOF guidance looks like. To my knowledge, it's not yet in a nice little uh, pamphlet. Uh, and they don't go into methodology in detail, but I thought it was uh, worth uh, highlighting uh, this, that they took the approach of, yes, we're going to use RCTs. However, we're going to temper this with other published data and expert clinical experience, rather than just slavishly following RCTs. Now, that's probably heresy to say that, 
because the randomized controlled trial is supposedly the peak of evidence-based medicine. Uh, but again, like uh, Dr. Morgan, I went to the uh, church of uh, Bob Haney. And here's a nice little paper that Bob's group published now 20 years ago, where they looked at patients who were evaluated in their osteoporosis clinic and said, would you meet criteria for the RCTs? And for the most liberal drug trial, 21% of their patients would have gotten in the door. For all of the others, more than 90% of the patients that they actually saw in the clinic would not qualify. And they then, I think, appropriately questioned the applicability of the RCTs to osteoporosis patients that we actually see in the clinic. So I don't find the fact that, that BHOF utilized clinical judgment to be a detriment. I actually believe it to be a strength. All right, I'm gonna walk quickly through uh, the recommendations uh, from uh, the uh, update. And here are the universal recommendations and I've summarized this so it's not verbatim, but they basically finally have come out and said, talk to patients about their fracture risk and the consequences and emphasized loss of independence. This is something that our field has not done. This is their first recommendation. So talk to folks about loss of independence. They then went to nutrition and recommended 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams and incorporate calcium supplements if needed. And they recommended a 25D of greater than 30 nanograms per mil. Uh, Dr. Morgan has uh, gone over the calcium and vitamin D status. I'm not going to go into any detail, but obviously it remains uh, controversial. She's already showed you the sigmoid curve. Uh, the, the problem here with our trials is that if we're recruiting people who are nutrient sufficient, whether it's calcium, whether it's vitamin D, whether it's nutrient X, giving them more won't do anything other than potentially increase toxicity. And then he went on to say, well, duh, this is common sense but we continue to do trials of people who are nutrient replete. So what does common sense say about calcium? Uh, the hunter-gatherer calcium intake guesstimated was somewhere around 1200 milligrams per day, very comparable to what the BHOF recommendation is. What about calcium supplements and vascular risk? Not gonna go into it in detail, but I think it's plausible that if you have a calcium replete population and you give them more calcium, you might cause vascular calcification because toxicity is really your only possible outcome. You're not gonna benefit them. All you can do is harm them. Common sense for vitamin D says shoot for roughly 40 nanograms per mil. And Dr. Morgan has already showed you the vital trial and the editorial that this is the decisive verdict. I took a little different approach to this, the concept that no subgroups benefited and could ask if we could expect fewer fractures in the 400 people who had low 25 hydroxy D. And the only drug trial that I know of that had 400 people roughly was the etidronate trial published in 1990. And without going through the patient population in detail, these 400 women were at much, much, much higher fracture risk. They were female, they had an average of two vert fractures uh, at uh, baseline. Uh, they had a Z score at the time that was used, it was negative two seven. And then they looked at non-vertebral fractures over the course of this trial and they had six in the etidronate group and three in the placebo group. That sounds like those phosphonates don't reduce fractures. So clearly this group of vital was underpowered to show fractures. My conclusion is that vital decisively proves that vitamin D is a vitamin, not a bone active drug. I would also share with you the concept of toxicity 
from vitamin D. And I think that's what this study shows. This is an off-sited study where they uh, looked at uh, PQCT in a patient supplemented with 400, 4,000, or 10,000 units of uh, vitamin D3. All of them were vitamin D replete at baseline. There's their 25D numbers at baseline. And giving more vitamin D, the black squares, caused loss of radius BMD by PQCT. Again, what Haney told us, if you've got enough of a nutrient, giving more can only cause toxicity. Going back to the BHOF guidance, uh, I think stuff that we are all doing, Kristen alluded to this, think about risk factors of falls, guidance of toxins, and importantly, embraced FLS. They did come forward, I think this is an advance that basically said any broken bone as an adult demands evaluation. They didn't really change their BMD testing recommendations. It's screening at 65 in women, 70 in men. After age 50, between 50 and 69 with risk factors, if you've had a fracture measure BMD. They did come out with this guidance that I do think is beneficial. And that is that just like hypertension, if you've treated hypertension so that the blood pressure is normal, that doesn't mean that the hypertension has gone away. If you've treated osteoporosis so that your T-score is no longer worse than negative two and a half, it's appropriate to retain the diagnosis of osteoporosis. Their v VFA recommendations really didn't change. They made it a little bit more complicated. Uh, and they've got this group here at men age 70 to 79. They want you to demand a negative one five rather than a negative one zero T-score. Didn't really change anything here about the other risks uh, and uh, indications for VFA. Their pharmacologic intervention thresholds didn't really change. Initiate drug treatment if the DEXA T score is worse than negative two and a half, but they did bring the one third radius in, acknowledging that there is uncertainty. They continued to retain the 3% hip and 20% MOF risk, treat hip or vertebral fracture regardless of BMD, and treat if you've had a fracture of the humerus, pelvis, or distal forearm, if osteopenia. Is treatment for those with a prior fracture overuse of drugs? I frankly thought this in the past uh, until Bill Leslie uh, did this study uh, in the uh, Manitoba DEXA registry uh, where we defined normal bone as a T-score better than negative one and a TBS better than 1.31 and looked at about 2,500 women who sustained incident fractures. And the proportion of these women who had normal bone defined as above declines to virtually nothing. And overall, it's about 4%. And even with an incident wrist fracture, the likelihood of having normal bone is low. So this is not overuse of drugs. The vast majority of women who fracture do not have normal bone. How about osteoporosis prevention? And here's a different guideline. Uh, this is the NAMS position. And our field has largely abandoned prevention. Uh, I share this with you uh, just to point out that what you all know, that at the time of menopause, there's an opportunity to prevent the rapid loss and the deterioration of skeletal structure. Uh, it's probably most appropriate in women who already have uh, low BMD and are experiencing rapid loss. And they do come forward and say that estrogen is not a poison. So for younger, healthy postmenopausal women, particularly those with vasomotor symptoms who are candidates for prevention of bone loss, estrogen alone, if no uterus, or combined with progesterone or vasodoxepine are the most appropriate therapy. So the pendulum, I think, is swinging back towards estrogen being acceptable as an osteoporosis prevention approach. 
back to BHOF, monitoring and treatment response, monitor BMD at one to two years, and then as clinical judgment dictates, uh, less frequent BMD testing may be warranted in patients with normal BMD or osteopenia. In patients receiving drugs, think about fractures, think about patient adherence and need for continued or modified treatment, measure at the sites that we know. Five minutes. Thank you. Um, there isn't a lot of guidance uh, from BHOF on which drug to use. So I went to the ACE guidance. Uh, these drugs are listed alphabetically in ACE. Um, and they basically say, utilize anti-resorbers if you're at high risk, utilize anabolics at very high risk, and did define, which I think is very helpful, what very high risk means. For example, MOF greater than 30%. I will share with you that Frax Plus is coming. Uh, these are the huge data set that was utilized for Frax Plus. Um, I uh, had a chance to speak with Rene Rizzoli last month. He expected Frax Plus to be out last month. So we're going to see this imminently. It will add in things like recency of fracture and false history that will increase the proportion of very high and it will lead to increased use of anabolics. They defined osteoporosis in the interest of time. I'm going to skip this. Um, caveat regarding treatment recommendations, using cost benefit makes no sense. NICE, the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence in the UK conducted a cost benefit analysis and concluded that generic alendronate was cost effective if the MOF risk is 1%. That treats every woman age 65 and every man over 75. And Nick Harvey and company had an editorial pushing back on that. Therapeutic intervention threshold is challenging. I share this slide with you so you have the citation. The, the risk approach that came out with the best strategy was an MOF greater than 20%. We aren't doing that now in the States. We're still treating at a negative two and a half. If you're doing that, be aware that there's virtually no difference between a negative two, three and a negative two, five. The delta is 0.125 grams per square centimeter. And so moving from two, three to two, five is incredibly arbitrary. And if you're negative two, three, we're gonna treat you at an MOF risk of 20%. But if you're a negative two, five, you're gonna have a much lower fracture risk until you get to age 80. So if you're gonna follow this negative two, five, be aware of the inconsistency of these recommendations. How long to treat BHOF basically endorsed the ASBMR approach that says continue for up to 10 years. I'd remind you that AFF goes up dramatically after about five years. Here's the initial data from Kaiser, more recent data from Kaiser, AFF goes up after about five years whether benefit goes up is unclear. I point you to the Osteoporosis Canada update. This is expected next year. It's a very formal cost uh, 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 evidence-based approach. Finally, I'm gonna close by suggesting that the osteoporosis field should learn from others. Uh, this was a global consensus statement on menopausal hormone therapy. They put some docs around a table and said, come forward with a short document in bullet point style containing points of consensus regarding menopausal hormone therapy. Can you have anything more controversial? We took that approach here at UW to come forward with UW health recommendations. And I want to acknowledge my colleagues who had lead roles in this, Karen Hansen, Elaine Pelly, and Vidushi Sood. Can we produce a one-page document regarding osteoporosis? Well, we did. And this is opinion-based synthesis, offer DEXA testing as BHOF recommends, diagnose clinical osteoporosis. If the BMD T score is negative 2.5 or worse, 
10-year risk of MOF greater than 20 or prior fracture. Don't treat everybody with a T-score of negative 2.5. It fits on one page. Will it increase use of osteoporosis drugs? I hope so. Will it improve compliance? I hope so, because we're only treating for three to five years. Will it reduce fractures? I think it will. And finally, when you think about osteoporosis, consider a lifetime approach. And this is something that was advocated 25 years ago. Felicia Cosman brought it back in her editorial. And it basically said, if you're at very high risk, use an anabolic. Early on, use estrogen or raloxifene. And if you're not at high risk and you have osteoporosis, maybe monitoring is okay. If you're going to treat, use an intermittent bisphosphonate. And later on, probably denosumab. So to summarize, I think the BHOF guidelines are really pretty darn good. I think they are a step forward, recognizing that fracture risk is more logical than treating at a negative two and a half. I think we need to diagnose clinical osteoporosis, not be married to a T-score, the calcium and D we've talked about, treat based on an MOF risk of 20%, and anabolic first very high, bisphosphonates only for three to five years, and I thank you. Neil, this is Joe. So I have a, I, I didn't quite, I'm not sure I, I missed what you said or answered. I thought they still had the minus 2.5 in the guidelines. Did I miss that? Nope, they do. Okay. And, and uh, that's my point, Joe, is that, you know, negative 2.5 is great because it's simple, but you're treating people with radically different fracture risks. Absolutely. There's many women who are 55 at minus 2.5 and their risks are 1.5 and 8. Um, so the, uh, another question, why did they choose 50 for the upper limit for the vitamin D? There's this noise out there that falls go up after 50 nanograms per mil. Okay. Um, I don't find that literature to be rock solid, but that is the rationale. Uh, with, know, the with the, no, sorry, with the data you've always shared about the accuracy of the vitamin D assays and that the, who knows if a 30 is actually a 20, I always find a, a target that like if I'm trying to keep someone above 30, so I kind of want them above 40 to feel confident that's happening. Uh, I, I guess I've always allowed me to go up into the 50s in order to it just, it's too tight a window to hit if I'm, if I'm thinking there's that much wiggle room in my um, confidence in what on in my lab estimate of my my patient's actual vitamin d status i totally agree and um uh, my mentor when i was an intern uh told me that human physiology was smarter than i was uh he was right and <clears throat> human physiology can take you to 60 and maybe as high as 70 nanograms per mil with a lot of sun exposure uh, i find it impossible to believe that um, you know, for all the time that humans have been on this planet, if we could get to 60 nanograms per mil, and that was bad, um, something bad would have happened to us and we wouldn't have been able to do that. So I agree with you. Uh, I, I don't get concerned about uh, 50, 60, 65 at all. Um, yeah, but uh, but that, to, to, to Joe's question, why did they pick 50? It's because there's this dogma out there that above 50, you get an increased falls risk. I think that's probably wrong. Can you comment on why you think our field has abandoned prevention? Speaking as speaking as sort of a middle-aged woman, and uh, uh, I've thought kind of all along, especially, especially ironic in the era where um, where treat to target sort of was talked about a lot and trying to maintain trying to achieve certain bone density um, targets. It's always struck me as a complete missed opportunity to not uh, prevent uh, estrogen withdrawal of mediated bone loss. So I actually do it a lot in my clinic, um, a fairly short course of bisphosphonates, either, either at the time of menopause um, or, uh, or upon the decision to halt estrogen therapy. Uh, and it works. And I always feel like I'm preventing a 
it, you know, versus the people who weren't treated, then I see them at 55 and they're minus 3.3 and people are like, well, you're so young and so low, should we be doing an anabolic? And I'm like, we could have prevented this so easily. And I feel like it's just this giant missed opportunity. I totally agree with you. I, I have this delusion that every woman at the time of menopause- ZA, one dose of zolondrotic zol acid in menopause, you and me both. I, that's, I, think we, I think we could change the shape of our field by doing that. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, I think uh, the reason that we're not doing it is that there's this just pervasive view that the drugs are bad. And, um, uh, you, you know, I think that, that the osteoporosis field would like to minimize AFL. You know, we always say that, well, the risk and benefit, blah, blah, blah. But AFF is not that rare. And lots and lots of our patients know somebody who's had an AFL. And, and that scares folks. And that's why I think this three to five years of bisphosphonate and take a holiday um, is going to reduce the, the AFF and the fear. But I, I think you're right. I, I've been reading a lot of DEXs these days. And um, I, I, every week I see a woman who, for whatever reason, had her DEXA done at age 50 and then again at 65, and her bone density has gone down by 25%. Mm -hmm. um, th this, is, this is human physiology, and it's a, it's a huge missed opportunity. But I, I think that um, you know, people are just tired of trying to talk about bisphosphonates and the side effects and my jaw is going to fall off. Um, but I, I agree with you. If we gave everybody an infusion of Zol, we'd do a whole lot of good. I actually find that group one of the most receptive to treatment, uh, particularly because you, you can say, hey, we'll, we'll do this for, you know, insert short number of years here. Uh, and then you may not need another an osteoporosis drug again for 15, 20 years. And um, I actually find that particular group when you talk about the, you know, what to expect and sort of the fact that this is a, a window opportunity to, that could be improve their trajectory for, you know, for the long haul. Um, it's, a, it's actually a, one of the easier uh, groups to, to um, come to agreement on. This is very anecdotal, but the uh, the number of patients that I'm seeing that were started on raloxifene at age 50 and had a DEXA with a little osteopenia at 50, and I'm seeing them now at 65 or 70, 20 years later, bone density has been nice and stable on 20 years of raloxifene. I feel like we, um, you know, we, we forget about it sometimes, but it's a very powerful tool, particularly in the primary care world, I would say.